Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament passage of Joshua. The Old Testament passage of Joshua and Joshua chapter number 10. Joshua and chapter number 10. We are <laughs> hitting a message dealing with prayer. We started a message this morning talking about how big is your mouth. The Bible talks about in the book of Psalms. <coughs> That to open our mouth wide and God will fill it. And we saw many Bible promises where God asked the question, is there anything too hard for me? He gives us the promise to open our mouth wide and fill it. He explained that he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or ask. We have a God who is able. And we saw the theology of it today. We saw the promise of it with the idea that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as you see the word of God and you can see these promises that God said, ask everything, believe, trust in him, watch him come through that we could trust him with the impossible. Tonight, we wanted to take the practical we saw what the Bible said. Now let's go to the practical and see, does it work? Can God hear and answer prayers dealing with the impossible? And so if you don't mind, take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Joshua in chapter number 10. The book of Joshua and chapter number 10. And let's look at a wonderful, amazing passage that happened in the history of Israel. Joshua in chapter number 10. Notice with me in verse number 1. Now it came to pass when Adonizek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king. So he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. That they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore Adonizek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Horam, king of uh, Hebron, and unto Piram, the king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, the king of Lachish, and unto Debir, the king of Eglon, saying, Come unto me and help me, that we may smite Gibeon. For it had made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Ammonites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their host, in a camp before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the king of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not. For I have delivered them into thy hand, and there shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly, and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomforted them before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon, and smote unto Azekah, and unto Mekedah. And it came to pass that as they fled before Israel and were going down before Beth Horon, that the Lord cast great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekah, and they died. And there were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day which the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people avenged themselves upon their enemies. 
Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like it before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. <laughs> Excuse me. And if you are in the habit of marking things in your Bible, notice a phrase that we find in the book of Joshua chapter 10. So the sun stood in the midst of heaven. So the sun stood in the midst of heaven. And of course, commonly this is referred to as the day that the sun stood still. The day that the sun stood still. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and then we'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And thank you that we had the opportunity this morning to open up the Bible and to see these wonderful promises that you give in the New Testament and the Old Testament, speaking about there is nothing too hard for you, that nothing is impossible, that you are a God who can answer these prayers. With men, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. You told us to open up our mouth wide and that you would fill it. You said that you're able to do exceedingly above all that we could think or ask. And whereas that sounds good on paper, the practicality of it sometimes is where we miss it. If we believe this could happen, sometimes we still doubt and we fail to pray. I'm asking that this message would encourage people that they would pray and that they would pray big prayers. That they would test and they would try and they would see if you will not keep your word. And that you would do wonderful things in our midst, especially as this upcoming year, as we become a people who learn what it is to pray and to get a hold of our God. Again, fill me with your spirit that you direct my path, that you would let it be clear, let it be easily understood, and let it be a help to these good folks today that they could even start tonight by asking for these big impossible prayers. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, of course, we're covering a bit of history in this. You may remember before that the Gibeonites were Canaanites who came and fooled Joshua. That they failed to pray on this and they came with old clothes and old shoes. And they said, we traveled a far way and we heard about you and please join us. And they failed to pray on it so they gave their word. And part of their word is that they would not destroy Gibeon, but in fact that they would actually protect them. And so guess what? They are tested on it. We see quickly in the passage here dealing with this historical event, the attack on Gibeon. That the kings gathered together and they realized that Gibeon was a big threat. And so they gathered these kings together and they circled around Gibeon. They began plans to destroy them. And some Gibeonites snuck out. They went and approached Joshua and said, all right, we're calling our favor. You said you protect us. We need you now. They're planning on destroying us. And so immediately Joshua went out. And we see afterwards very quickly that the attack by Joshua. And with this, we're going to dive back into the scripture. Notice with me in verse number 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said, so as we come up here, we notice that Joshua is not going on a whim, but he's already praying and talking to God. And God says, you do this. I'm giving you permission. You go out. Fear not. You go out. And the Lord said unto Joshua, fear them not, for I, the Lord, hath delivered them into thy hand, and there shall not of them, a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from, from Gilgal all night. So Joshua, when he heard about this, he prayed, talked to God. God says, go. And so Joshua in the middle of the night gathered up all of his people and they made the trek to Gibeon. Now at this time, Gibeon's inside of the walls. The other enemy's armies are outside of the walls. Joshua comes in the middle of the night. They go all night, him and his men. And so already I want you to kind of keep the time frame of this. So Joshua and his men are up all day keeping doing all their regular stuff. They're told early afternoon, hey, we need some help. Joshua gathers up with these people after he prays. And they travel all night to get to Gibeon. So as they get to Gibeon, notice what happened in verse 10. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way. So 
as Joshua and the people come overnight, God gave them great favor. And they began to destroy all of the Ammonites that were there. Then the Ammonites realized they were in trouble and they began to flee. They began to run. And so Joshua did his part. He's fought against him. But now all these people are getting away. And God says, nope, we're not done there. So we went from the attack on Gibeon to the attack by Joshua. Then we see the attack by God. God gets involved in this. Notice in verse 11. And it came to pass as they fled before Israel and were going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them at Azekah and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they which the children of Israel slew. So Joshua and his men come in the middle of the night. Early morning as the people are beginning to rise up and they're surrounding the city. Joshua begins to take them. He begins to destroy them. Ruins the ranks. Now remember there's five armies gathered together. There's kings that are gathered together. There's whole entire armies. And Joshua and his men begin to beat them all with the Lord's help. And they start taking off and running. And God says, no I'm not done with you yet. And a storm comes. And hailstones begin to fall. And there's so big hailstones, they're bopping people on the head. And more people are getting killed by the hailstones than Joshua and his men coming up in the middle of the night. But they're not done yet. God says, I wanted them all gone. And so now they're slowed down. People are hiding from the hailstones. Notice in verse number 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day which the Lord delivered up the Ammonites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajon. So here, <laughs> the hailstones come, and they knock people. It's kind of dis stop their runaway. And Joshua stands before all of Israel and the army. He looks down at those people and says, we could get them, but... We need something called daylight. We don't want the sun to go down. We, we need to fight them all. And so can you imagine what courage, what faith it took to stand before everyone and say, stand still, son, as he's praying to God. Think about some of your prayers that you make. Are you bold enough to tell someone what you're praying for? Those secret things that you say, I need to happen, but I'm almost too afraid. Joshua was able to step out by faith. I mean, what happened if it didn't get answered? That's the type of prayer that he had. God, you're going to have to come through. Otherwise, this whole thing falls apart. I'm stepping out by faith so much that I'm going to fall on my face if you don't answer this. That's the faith that he stepped out and had. And that's a pretty brave thing. He's standing before all of Israel. Now remember, he has God's promise. God said, none of them will stand before you. All of them are going to be gotten. And there's a, a bunch of armies out there. They've already got some of them that they killed as they snuck up on them in the early morning. A whole bunch of them got killed by the hailstorm. But God said, they're all going to be gone. There's a whole bunch starting to get away. So God... If we're going to get them, they're going to sneak off. If it turns night, they're going to find some place to hide. You said they're all going to be gone. So you notice his prayer is based off of God's promise already. It wasn't an arbitrary thing where he says, Hey, you know what? I want to show off before everyone. Hey, sun stand still. It wasn't the idea that he was showing off. It's the idea that God had already given him a promise. And that in order to carry out, there was the practicality. It was a practical thing. Now, if they had flashlights, if they had flares, if they had night vision goggles, then that wouldn't be necessary. They'd find some other way. But they didn't have that back then. There's a practicality. In order for God to carry out what he said he was going to do, a miracle needs to happen. I'm claiming God's promise, and based off of God's earlier promise, I'm asking for the impossible, for the sun to stand still. Verse 13, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their people. And so God just says, hey, they cleaned house. The sun stayed where it was supposed to until they were done. But notice something else interesting that occurs here in verse 13. 
And the sun stood still, and the people stayed, and the people avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of the heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Now, some people get thrown off and said, well, what about this book of Jasher? If you look through your Bible, you'll find in the table of contents, there's no book of Jasher. Did we lose something? Did something fall apart? No, what it's referring to is an extra biblical book, a history book that records it. Now, the real book of Jasher dis was disappeared about the 6th century BC. There is a couple of fake books out there called the name Book of Jasher. But again, these are not extra or not biblical books. They're not inspired. They are not lost books. They're a history book. There's nothing wrong with other history books. In fact, what it's emphasizing here is that this isn't just recorded in the Bible. This is recorded in other history accounts. Other people noticed, hey, the sun's not going down. I wonder why. I mean, if the sun didn't go down, don't you think someone else would notice? Someone's looking at their watch and saying it's not matching up. So what this is referring to is that this miracle was not just recorded in the Bible. It was confirmed by extra sources. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Aren't you glad that we have confirmation? It wasn't just something that was made up, that there was confirmation with it. Verse 14 sums it up like this. There was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought with Israel. What an amazing account here. This as an impossible prayer, a big prayer. God had already laid some groundwork and based off of God's promise before, he said, let the sun stand still. That's a big prayer. That's a major prayer. And do you know that God is able to work the impossible? He was able to do it until God's word was completed, until it was finished, until what God said was done. Do you know that God loves to hear and answer prayer? God's able to do so many things. And if you don't mind, I'd like to cover some extra biblical, meaning it's not found in the Bible, but some modern cases of some answers to prayer for the purpose to encourage you that that, still, that same God can still hear and answer prayers. I give you the case of George Mueller up in Bristol, England in the late 1800s. George Mueller... <coughs> had come to know Lord as his Savior, and he had wanted to be a missionary, but God directed him to run orphanages. And one of the things that George Mueller wanted to do with these orphanages is that he wanted to watch God supply. And so what George Mueller did is he took time to pray for the daily needs of the orphanages. And his own autobiography, he would list times where the orphanages didn't have any food. And so he woke up early in the morning and what are we going to do? This is a practical thing. Our kids need to eat. And the bigger they are, the more they like to eat. And so we got to do something. And so he would give examples like, all right, I'm going to pray. And he would begin to pray and talk to the Lord. And the next thing you know, there's a knock on the door. And a bakery truck shows up. A bakery wagon shows up and said, you know what? We uh, misread an order and we have a whole bunch of extra bread. Do you, can you have any use for it? You bet we could. George Mueller was so convinced that he could trust God that he made a pledge not to, to take up public con, uh, collections. Meaning that he didn't have people ringing bells outside. He didn't pass offering plates. He didn't put up a little internet thing of go fund me. He didn't do any of that. He said, let's just pray in the money. And without ever collecting a public, um, uh, uh, a public collection, he raised in the late 1800s, by the way, over seven and a half million dollars for those orphanages to run. If you would have put that in today's inflation rate, that's well over 30 million dollars without ever doing a public collection, without ever saying, hey, we need money. He said, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to pray. They said over 100,000 orphans went through his orphanages during those, those spans. Could you imagine that? Just saying, I'm going to trust God and God alone. Now, he wasn't against public offerings like we do at church. 
He just said, for me, I want to put God to the test. And I'm going to see if he's going to do it. Almost $8 million in the late 1800s, this man prayed in. God can work. That's an impossible prayer, isn't it? And God did that quite often. As we continue with the idea, you take someone like a D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody had less than a public school education. Some sources say that he had only up to a fourth grade education. Some say that he had up to an eighth grade education. I guess it depends on what education system you're looking at. But he was not very well educated. He did not speak well. But yet this man who had less than, a fourth, uh, less than an elementary education, barely an educa- uh, elementary education, he saw a huge Sunday school, a church, and a college built. And thousands upon thousands of people coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Saw two continents shaken for the Lord because of his prayer. I believe it was D.L. Moody who said, I've got so much to do that I cannot take less than 10 or I cannot take less than three hours a day to pray because I got so much to do. So much needs to be done. They said that D.L. Moody would get done sometimes midnight, one o'clock and then wake up by four and begin to pray and take time to pray for a couple hours just to start his day. He watched things happen because of his prayer. Impossible things. Revivals breaking out. You take someone like a J. Hudson Taylor. J. Hudson Taylor was one of the pioneers in the mission field. Now today, we have missionaries that raise up support and go out. J. Hudson Taylor said, if God wants me to go, he's going to have to supply for me. And he went to China. Now at that time, inland China was not opened up to any of the Western world. But yet J. Hudson Taylor, by faith and by prayer, made his way and started churches and saw people get saved in inland China. Open up the door. But that wasn't all. He kept coming back to the United States, not to raise money, but to raise up laborers. He would preach in colleges, preach in churches, and say, I don't need your money. I need souls. Who will go to China with me? He had thousands of a missionary force of thousands open up inland China because of his prayer. In fact, hundreds of those missionaries went without a promise of any kind of support as he prayed them in and watched God provide. Amazing story. If you've never read the story of J. Hudson Taylor and his spiritual secret, you need to read it. Just seeing that this is a man of prayer. Maybe we could get specific There was an evangelist, a preacher by the name of Brilly uh, Brilly Billy Bray. And I love studying Billy Bray. Everywhere he walked, he said, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. It was sometimes that they were said for him, he would take a step, praise the Lord, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Everywhere he went. Well, they needed a pulpit for the church he was at. And so he had at that time only eight shillings. So he decided he was going to go to a public auction where they had a nice cabinet, small cabinet. And he went with uh, the idea of spending six shillings to try to go at this auction to get this, this cabinet. And in it, he, he, as they begin to go, God says, that's the one you're going to get. So, of course, he bid on it. Six shillings. Then his heart fell as someone said seven shillings, eight shillings, nine. And finally, he said, oh... I can't do anything. And he says, God, you promised me. You told me I'm going to get that. God said, just wait. All right. And so he uh, was going around town. And he happened across where a barkeeper had bought the one who got the auction. Him and his men were trying to get this cabinet inside of the... uh, Inside of the facility where it was at. And they were struggling and they couldn't get it in. And they were getting frustrated and said, why did I get this thing in this, any place? So Brilly Bay went up and said, I'll give you eight shillings for it right now. Sold! He says, before we do that, I also, can I borrow the wagon and the uh, horses to go uh, bring it where it's supposed to? Yeah, go ahead and help yourself. And he said, praise the Lord. I only had six shillings and I, to buy it and I didn't know how I was going to get it home. And God had it prepared. And he was able to get it and the transportation to get there. God knows what he's doing. You talk about someone like a John R. Rice. 
John R. Rice would often have ladies' jubilee meetings. And during the ladies' jubilee meetings, he would talk about Hannah from the Bible. And oh, Hannah, she wanted a baby and she wanted a baby, but she couldn't have a baby. And he would pray, uh, explain that she prayed and oh, Hannah had, a, had prayer and God answered her prayer and he gave her a baby. And they would have ladies come to these jubilees who were, who were uh, barren, who couldn't have children for one reason to another. And at the end of the meeting, Dr. Rice would say, all right, for all of you who are like Hannah and that you want to have a baby, please stand. And ladies would stand and he would pray. And it would be amazing how his prayers would be answered. These ladies who could not have any children. Uh, Dr. Curtis Hudson, who worked with John R. Rice, met one guy who said that, yeah, for many years my wife couldn't have a child. And now we're at child number seven. Is there any way to turn it off? John R. Rice was known for this prayer and praying for ladies with Hannah. And towards the end of his life, he had already had a stroke and he was in a wheelchair, but they still had him pray. And one of his last messages he preached, he was preaching about Hannah and he got his invitation a little bit wrong. And he just had, um, he said, all right, everyone, please stand. So everyone stood, stand, uh, began, uh, all stood. And so Dr. Rice started to pray and said, oh, dear God. You see everyone that's standing up here. I'm praying that you would make them all have children. And he said all of a sudden. People started diving down. Uh, sitting down. Uh, one lady said oh no I misunderstood. She's in a wheelchair wheeling herself out of there. Dr. Curtis Hudson said he sat down. Just in case he had a baby. Just, but he was just so known for praying. And people would come. And see the answers to prayer. I heard of a. <laughs> An evangelist who was known for prayer, and he taught a lot about a lot about prayer. We well, had a little girl who um, <laughs> wanted a little doll, and so she looked and saw it and said, "How much is that little dolly?" And her dad said it was uh, four dollars and ninety eight cents. And like little kids do, she goes, "How many pennies is that?" And <laughs> they said it's four hundred ninety pennies or ninety eight pennies. And she goes, "Okay, well, I'll start praying for that." And so she began to pray. And a little bit later, an old lady came with a milk jug full of pennies and said, you know, I've got this milk jug and I've been collecting pennies in here and I don't know what to do with them. And I thought that your daughter might want to have them. And so she began to count them out. And wouldn't you know how many pennies there was? It wasn't 501 pennies. It wasn't 495 pennies. To the penny, it was 498 pennies. You know, God is able to answer prayers. He's able to do such things. He is able to work. I heard of a Sunday school superintendent or Sunday school teacher. They had 15 in the class. And so he, uh, he said, all right, kids, we're going to pray that next week we double that. Let's just by faith pray that next week we'll double it. So 15 doubled is going to be 30. So he said, Lord, double the class. Bring them in next time. Well, next Sunday he was looking forward to and watch kid after kid come in. You know, 15 come in, 20 come in, 30 come in, 31, 40, 50. And he's like, what happened? What, what worked? Uh, how did we get all these kids? And one kid in the back said, I'm sorry, teacher. It's my fault. When we were praying, I decided I was going to pray for 50. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God is able to work. He is able to work. You know, I am nowhere near these group of men and people that pray. You know, I heard of a story uh, from a book called Deeper Experiences from Famous Christians. There was a lady who was a little bit feeble. She was uh, in her home and she didn't have the strength. And a huge snowstorm came. And she goes, I don't, I don't have the ability to, to plow. No one here is going to come and shovel my snow. But I really want to go to church. And I want to go to church badly. But I can't even make it outside my door. And so she says, God, I want to get to church so badly. Please, but I can't. The snow's in the way. I can't make it even to the road outside of my house. And wouldn't you know, a couple of horses came. And they began just to stomp all around her yard and stomped a path and then just took off. She goes, thank you, Lord. God is able to work. He's able to answer prayers and do things. We just need to pray. Again, I'm nowhere near <laughs> this type of thing. But we've seen answers to prayer. 
I remember when I was in Bible college and it was at a time where I was waiting to uh, get a hospital job. I was, they were doing the background checks and we were in extended time. I was at a time where all three of my kids were in diapers. That's always fun, especially when you have no money. And we remember putting in the last diaper on a child that next night and we didn't have any hope for any money in the coming future. And diapers are kind of important, you know, with kids. When they said that they, that 30 to 45 pounds, that's true. That's all they can hold. And that you need to change it after that time. And so we laid the kids to bed and we prayed. I don't know where we're going to get diapers from. Lord, this is a need. We woke up the next morning. I'm getting ready to go to class. And guess what was waiting outside of our door? Package of diapers. And we didn't tell anybody about it. Nobody knew. We didn't call and complain to the neighbors or anything. We just brought it to God and said, we don't know how it's going to work. And to this day, we don't even know who placed it there. That's minor, but that's a big deal when you don't have diapers. God is able to work. We've even seen major prayers answered. I had a man that I'd been witnessing to for quite a while. And he worked a night shift as a nurse. And, and he would always be amazed by me at 2 o'clock in the morning when I met him. He would say, how you doing? And I would say, I'm blessed. And he said, how can anybody be blessed and happy like this at 2 o'clock in the morning? It's just not right. It's not natural. But, you know, we began to talk. And he would talk to me because of that. And there were times that we had Brother Summerdorf, who we're having later this year, and he was having a family conference. And I said, hey, uh, a good preacher's coming in where he's going to have a family conference. It's going to be a help to you and your family. He says, me and my wife, we're doing good. We're, we're fine. We don't need it. I said, oh, well, you could always use some encouragement and, and some help. So we'd love to invite you. Well, as the meeting came closer and closer, nope, nope, nope. You know, he didn't think about it. Finally, Brother Summerdorf left. And... Uh, Right after he left, the next Monday, he says, hey, did I miss that conference? And I said, yeah. He says, oh, I'm kind of disappointed because my wife and I were, were having lots of troubles and I could really use the help. I said, well, would it be all right if we talked to you and your wife tonight? Can, can we come over and, and me and my pastor, we'd be glad to talk to you a little bit more and see what we could do. He says, oh, I guess, okay. And so we set an appointment that afternoon. We both work night shift. And so we try to plug it so we could get some day of sleep. Well, I continued with my job and halfway through it, um, I had already talked to my wife and said, let's pray. We want these two people to get saved. Well, halfway through my shift, he calls me and says, it's already too late. She's packing out her bag. She says she's not going to be available tonight. She's, she's already gone and says, you don't need to come over. I said, well, how about this? How about we come over and I talk with you and, and if your wife is there, we'll be glad to make ourselves available. And he says, I don't see what much, much good it is. She's already had enough. She's got her bags packed. She said she's leaving now. But if you want to come, you could come. All right. So I called my wife and I said, we need to pray. We don't have much time. We need to pray. We got back home and my wife and I fell on our faces and we prayed together. We de I decided to fast from sleep for a little bit. And let's pray together. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Let's pray that they get saved. Let's pray that she'll be there. Let's pray that she'll be willing to talk to us. And it was a dark and stormy night in Phoenix, Arizona, when my pastor and I went and drove to their house and oh, knocked on the door. And he said, come on in. And he says that she's upstairs and she's not coming back down. And I said, well, that's fine. We'll start. And we prayed. And my pastor tried to talk with him a little bit. And I prayed, let her come down. And soon enough, she got curious enough and came down. And that day in that dark, stormy night, both of them bowed their head and accepted Christ as their Savior. Oh, and almost 15 years later, that family is still in the same church serving the Lord. God can work. In fact, it's almost dangerous when my wife and I get together on our face and start praying for people. We watch things happen. All I'm trying to do is give you some resources Trying to show you that some practical stories. You know, you of course expect God to answer Moses' prayer. He's Moses. Of course God's going to answer Abraham. He's Abraham. But God wants to answer your prayers. He wants you to open up your mouth wide. And he will fill it. Just pray. Pray. Let God work. Pray the impossible prayers. Pray pr prayers that you don't say there's no way it could ever happen unless God does it. Maybe you do have someone that's far away from the Lord. Pray.
Maybe you know someone that's not saved. You know they need to be saved. Pray. Let God do work. By faith believing. Trust God for him to do it. Maybe it's a physical thing. Maybe it's a health thing. I don't know how I'm going to get over this health thing. I don't see how it's going to get fixed. Pray. Pray. Maybe it's a financial thing. Maybe it's a thing where you open up your drawer and there's bills. You open up your mailbox and your bills. And you line them all up and say, I don't know how it's going to happen. Pray. Dr. Curtis Hudson, one of my favorite preachers. He said that there was a time (coughs) that him and his wife, um, they had all the bills and they laid them out and they prayed. And they said, told them up and said, God, we need this exact amount. I don't know where it's going to come from. Wouldn't you know someone gave him a love offering? Didn't even know about it. Said, I don't even know you. I just felt led and sent him a check from across the country for the exact amount. God is able to work. I could go story after story, but I don't want to go story after story. I want you to have your own stories. I want it to be able to use examples from you. Let me tell you about what God did for me because God can do it. He's able to do the impossible. I want you to think about your stories that you could look forward to. What is the impossible? You think of famous people who prayed, I want to be a mighty soul winner. What's wrong with saying, Lord, I want you to use me to see 1,000 people bow their head and accept Christ as their Savior. That's an impossible prayer, but can God do that? Absolutely. Wouldn't it be wonderful to get that 1,000 and go, woohoo, look at what God did. I'm going to pray for another 1,000. 1,000 people who bow their head and accept Christ as their Savior because you were the instrument used. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You could pray that. God, use me. Use me like that. I want to be used in that way. How can you be used of God? Maybe it's the idea that says, I may not be good, but Lord, I'd love to give $100,000 to missions. Now, probably not all at once, but, you know, over my life, I'd be, wouldn't it be wonderful to be used of God, to be used personally to see $100,000 to missions given? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be amazing? God can do that. Pray big prayers. Put big numbers on it. You know, to God, $10 is just as easy to answer as $100,000. Just zeros to him. It's a big deal to us, but to God, it's nothing. He is able to work. Ask spiritual prayers. God changed that person's heart. We can't change people's hearts. I mean, as much as we'd like to grab someone by the shoulders and shake them, it doesn't work. Some of you probably have tried. But God is able to change hearts. He's able to do the impossible. He is able to work. Put him to the test. What big prayers could you pray for? Wouldn't it be wonderful if some of you became such great prayer warriors? That almost like that lady who said, Lord, I need to get to church. Just, I I need to get to church. Can you get rid of the snow and have the horses come? And that'd be kind of like, this happens all the time. God is able to hear and answer prayers. We just need to pray. He's waiting. He wants, he delights when people pray big prayers because he gets the credit for it. Look at what God did. Look at what he did. Let me tell you, Uncle Joe couldn't answer this. My brother couldn't answer this. It was God that supplied. It was God that worked. Put him to the test. Open your mouth wide and he will fill it. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness 
of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.